But meanwhile, the United States was on its way in July of 1969 to what many consider the greatest achievement of all. Uh, and that, of course, would be the flight to the moon. And this is a very familiar story. It's a story we don't need to go into great detail about, but maybe we can pick up the story as the Saturn V has successfully launched Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin in their command module with their service module behind. The docking, which now Armstrong was a real pro at, happened very easily with the lunar module. On the way to the moon they went, and the time finally came on July 20th to undock the lunar module so that Aldrin and Armstrong could land on the moon. And they would be slowly descending to the moon, standing up, because the lunar module, remember, had to be really light. There's no room for seats on the lunar module. They'd be too needlessly heavy. So they're going to be standing up all the way to the moon. They crawled into the lunar module. And then, as scheduled, the undocking took place. And Armstrong delightedly told Houston, as they slowly began to descend, the eagle has wings. But what nobody was quite aware of was that things were not going to be easy for Neil Armstrong. One reason was there was a navigational error that meant that the designated landing place was not exactly where the lunar module was going to go, nicknamed the Eagle by this point. And that meant that Neil Armstrong was eventually going to have to do some piloting to get it to a place where it could actually land. Well, he didn't know that yet, but that navigational error was about to become a big deal. And the other thing was there'd been a tiny puff of air at the time of the undocking. And that was also going to throw the craft off just a little bit more. And because of that, any landing that was going to take place was never going to be the responsibility of the Raytheon computer on board. It was going to demand all the skills that Armstrong had. And he didn't quite know that yet, as slowly the lunar module began to descend. From uh, 60 miles up, about 7,600 feet per second at first, and then gradually slowing down, maybe a little bit faster than it was supposed to go, but, but gradually slowing down the closer they got to the lunar surface. And then about 33,000 feet from the surface, uh, descending a, a bit more slowly by this point, uh, Armstrong figured out that, in fact, they were going to a somewhat different place than he thought. And as he was trying to process that information, the last thing anybody wanted to see happened and that was an alarm went off. All of a sudden, a red light goes off in the Eagle. And back at Houston, they can see the same red light. And of course, everybody's on pins and needles. Not just people at Mission Control, but there's hundreds of millions of people all around the world watching this. They can't see the alarm light, but the folks at Mission Control sure could. And at this point, the uh, flight director, uh, the legendary Gene Kranz, turned to the man who was acting as the guidance officer, Steve Bales, and asked him, what does that light mean? What do we have to do? Do we have to abort? There might be enough fuel to get back to the command module if they had to abort the mission. And at this point, Steve Bales turned to a 24-year-old engineer, a designer, software designer named Jack Garman, who knew all about those alarm lights, knew everything about the LEM. And Bales asked Garman, do we abort? And with the weight of the world and billions of dollars in expense, on his shoulders, this 24-year-old engineer, Garmin, turned to Krantz in Bales and said, uh, that light is probably nothing to worry about. We don't have to abort. Armstrong now got the welcome news. It was a go. And slowly but surely, down they went. At 2,000 feet above the surface, at this point, Armstrong was descending at about, 200, about 20 feet per second, much slower, taking more and more careful note of the surface as he went. And he could see for himself pretty clearly by now that there was no way he could land where they were supposed to land. There were too many boulders. It'd be very risky to land the lunar module there. Uh, they were off course. It was not the place where they were supposed to be. The computer was taking them to a dangerous place instead. It's boulders down there. And that meant Armstrong had to do some quick thinking. At a, about 20 feet per second, uh, gliding towards the, the moon's surface, he now began to pilot the lunar module horizontally, looking for a place to land. And that's not really what the lunar module was supposed to do. 
it was supposed to go down and then go up. It's not supposed to go sideways. And back at Mission Control, people began to gasp. And little by little, some people began to shout, he's going sideways, he's going sideways. But Armstrong had no choice. And the thing that was on everybody's mind now was that Armstrong had maybe a minute to play with. Because if he wasted too much fuel looking for a place to land, other than the designated place where the boulders were, that meant that they wouldn't have enough fuel to take off again from the lunar surface. And if they lost that much fuel looking for a place to land, they would die on the lunar surface. And every time you looked up for the rest of our lives to the moon, you would think of these two men up there on the moon having perished for lack of fuel. So imagine the pressure as Armstrong methodically looked for a landing place. 40 seconds of fuel left, 50, uh, 30 seconds of fuel left. Meanwhile, Aldrin was getting more and more nervous, but he can't just turn to Armstrong, say, Neil, land us, land us. Uh, all he could do is shout out the uh, altitude uh, in, in the, the designated location as he went, while Armstrong looked for a place to land. And some people believe that this was one of the most supreme moments in the history of human flight. Because imagine what Neil Armstrong was doing. Uh, he was flying something, this lunar module, different from anything anybody had ever flown before. And he was flying it using throttles concocted from scratch. Nobody had ever used those before. And he was flying this thing in one sixth Earth gravity with no air over an unfamiliar landscape with literally increasingly no margin of error in a craft pretty much the same as the thing that had blown up when he was in the simulator back over Cape Canaveral just a few months before. And yet keeping that cool head he had shown in Gemini 8, Armstrong just continued to look for a landing space until he found one, uh, told Aldrin he'd found a place, and down goes the lunar module with 17 seconds to spare. 17 seconds between the two astronauts and complete catastrophe. The first word spoken from the moon was contact. As Aldrin shouted contact, the light was on. The uh, four legs of the lunar module had reached the moon's surface. And at that point, Aldrin and Armstrong saw something nobody had ever seen before. Whenever anything comes from a place that's up to the Earth's surface, you might see dust go up. But what happens next is the dust goes down. Well, when the lunar module, when the eagle landed, the dust did go up, but then it spread horizontally, radially, in all directions. Because after all, there was so little gravity. Nobody had ever seen that before. But the eagle was now on the moon, and that left it to Armstrong to speak these immortal words. Engine arm is off. Houston, tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. Words that culminated the uh, eight years of the American space program since Alan Shepard had become the first American in space. And I would like to point out that nobody had planned to call this tranquility base. This was the sea of tranquility uh, on the moon but remember Armstrong, Aldrin, and the rest of the astronauts, they were all military guys. And it was natural for Armstrong to believe that wherever the US military was, that's a base. And that's why he said, tranquility base here, Eagle has landed. The moment had come. And as we all know, shortly thereafter, Armstrong exited followed by Aldrin and walked on the lunar surface. And that was the end of the race, the last of the great milestones in the United States had won it. And the fact that it had happened this way was due not just to the three factors I mentioned about the Soviet failure, but largely and more importantly, to the skill of the engineers who were able to make this happen, to the commitment of the American taxpayers to allow this to happen, and above all, to the uh, almost unbelievable skill and courage of the astronauts who participated.